Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Crucio, and I'm here with my co-host, Federica Ernst. Today, we're talking with Kevin Awaki. He's the founder of Gitcoin, and he's now a member of the Gitcoin DAO. Before we talk to Kevin about Gitcoin, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet that enables you to control digital assets with much more granular permissions involving multiple private keys, a subset of which can, is required for executing transactions. These keys can be stored in different hardware wallets or software wallets or even shared across multiple people. Gnosis Safe's security and personalization makes it the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAO who already use it to store over $100 billion in USD's worth of assets today. So check out the latest iOS app, which has just been released, where you can send and receive funds, execute transactions, and receive push notifications on uh, all on your mobile device. Visit gnosis-safe.io to learn more and to get started setting up your own safe. We're also brought to you by Tally, which is a new Web3 wallet and DeFi wallet that uh, is a public good. So think of it like a community-owned version of MetaMask. It has all the features of MetaMask, but the difference is that Tally is 100% open source under the GPL3 license, and it's 100% user owned with all the profits flowing to the community, not a corporation. The launch of Tally is coming in the new year. Actually, it's already out now, uh, but the team have just released an early version to the community, uh, which is the Tally Community Edition before the DAO launches. Uh, what features do you think should be in your ideal wallet? What annoys you currently about your wallet that you're using? Well, try Tally and join the community on Discord. Their community calls feature a new partner each week and have about 500 uniques joining. You can get all the info you need at tally.cash. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us uh, once again today. It's, we we're just checking earlier and it's been since like, we last had you on in 2018. It was like right after Gitcoin Grants launched. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for coming back on. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's been a, been a couple of years, uh, which is, as we all know, a lifetime in, in the crypto space, but yeah, Gitcoin Grants is now our flagship product. So, uh, a lot has changed since I was last on the show. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, and I mean, Gitcoin has just grown so much since, you know, in the last three years and it's become such, a, like a pillar, uh, in the Ethereum community. Tell us a bit about, you know, your, your personal journey. Uh, since uh, we last spoke and you know, sort of, you know, try to summarize, you know, the last three years um, of your life and, you know, sort of the trajectory of Gitcoin. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been really lucky. Turns out there's a lot of people out there who want to get coins uh, and there's a lot of software developers who wanted to enter the space. And that's kind of our niche is connecting the software developers to the funding that can fund their work in open source. And I'm super proud that our mission has always been to grow and sustain open source software. Open source provides so much value for the world and there's just not a business model for it because the code is available for free. In fact, I think the number was $500 $400 billion per year in economic value, according to a study in 2014. And since there's no business model, developers are just working nights and weekends for free on open source software. And that's always been our mission is to correct that asymmetry between value created and value captured. Last time I was on the show, which was I think 2018, uh, we were primarily focused on doing bounties, which is basically if you do X, you will get Y coins on Gitcoin. And we've since expanded into Gitcoin grants, which is basically I'm already doing X and I would like to raise money for that work in open source software. And if you go to gitcoin.co slash results, you can see that we've done $51 million worth of funding for open source software with an accelerating trajectory as the market has turned around. And I think as our network effects has de- have deepened, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of been really staying anchored to that mission of building and funding open source software and digital public goods and just being kind of really, really trying to innovate on how we reach that mission has been the trajectory for the last three years. And so uh, super proud of the impact that we've had so far, but you know, $50 million is, is great, but like I said, $400 billion per year in economic value is created by open source software. So we're just scratching the surface of what we could do if our mission was successful in helping open source software developers get coins. Cool. Can you maybe give us a little bit uh, deeper look into the stats? So basically, how many different projects um, have received funding? Um, do they currently? Uh, do, do they usually come back every every round, or um, 
uh, are they one offs? And uh, I mean, so how many people in total have benefited? How many have have given to Gitcoin? And uh, yeah, sure. Well, uh, yeah, I'd direct the audience to gitcoin.co slash results, which is our open stats page. We like to be as transparent as possible with the stats. Uh, and the total is 65,000 funders uh, have given to an audience of 280,000 earners. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of people who are creating alt accounts as they have pseudonymous identities in there. Uh, 1.7 million complete transactions over the course of the last several years. So, um, you know, I'm most proud of projects like Uniswap and Urine Finance using Gitcoin during the last bear market uh, when funding had really dried up. Gitcoin grants had become a, a, a place where people could get, get funding during the bear market. And I'm really proud to have us supporting public goods like Wallet Connect and Prismatic Labs and Nimbus, the ETH clients that are out there, are, have a special place in my heart as a software developer who wants to see the people who are working on the foundation of our network getting paid. So uh, all in total, there's about a thousand Gitcoin grants that return every round and uh, take most of the funding every Gitcoin grants round. And there's kind of like a bell curve down to up and coming projects and newer projects in the space that can get discovered on Gitcoin. Because there's such a density of funding on Gitcoin, it's actually become sort of an interesting place where new projects can come and market themselves to the community and make a name for themselves. Because with Gitcoin grants, you're it's a crowdfunding platform where the median transaction is one dollar. And so it's a great way for for you know if a project raises from three thousand of their friends for them to say, hey, put, look at all these people who are our peers in the community that really care about our project. And then that can be a springboard for larger grants from, say, the Ethereum Foundation or I know that Uniswap now has a grants project. So it's a great way for newer projects to get momentum in the space by doing crowdfunding on Gitcoin grants. What's the measure of success here? Like, you know, you were talking earlier about the size of like the open source uh, market and the, like, the value that it creates. Like, how are you tracking the success of Gitcoin in the sort of broader uh, open source funding uh, paradigm? Yeah, well, the easiest number to track is just the amount of money that we've moved to software developers. But the number that's nearest and dearest to my heart is the number of people who can quit their jobs and just work on open source software. Um, if you've worked at JP Morgan Chase and now you're going to work on open source, then that's the future that we want to create. People who can pay their mortgage and pay their bills by working on public goods and open source software. And Vitalik Buterin, in one of his reviews of Gitcoin, talked about this idea of a quadratic freelancer, someone who is making enough money from um, Gitcoin grants or other public goods funding mechanisms that can now quit their job and work for the open internet. And it's just subsidized by quadratic matching. Uh, we, I, we haven't talked about quadratic funding, but that's basically the mechanism that underpins Gitcoin grants. And so the number, the number that's nearest and dearest to my heart is the number of people who have found new opportunities that we've opened doors for, uh, either by quitting their corporate jobs and working on Web3 or coming straight out of school if you're a student and working straight away on Web3. And it's a little bit hard to track that because we don't know exactly what people's employment are. We don't have a good data source for that. But uh, anecdotally, walking around at ETHCC and ETH Denver, I get approached by dozens of people who tell me, oh, Gitcoin opened X door for me or Y door for me. And it always feels great to have those moments where you've affected the trajectory of someone's career. And that's that's the metric that, that I optimize for. So let's talk about quadra quadratic funding. So where did the idea come from and how does it work? Yeah, so quadratic funding is basically uh, an idea from Glenn Weil, who's the author of Radical Markets, and Vitalik Buterin, who people may know as the founder of Ethereum, and Zoe Hitzig. And so basically the idea is that it's basically in you run a matching campaign where you match contributions to a crowdfunding campaign. And instead of doing one-to-one -one matching, what you do is you match by the number of contributors to each grant more so than the amount funded by each grant. So if the three of us all were running a grant on Gitcoin and uh, my grant got $100 from one contributor and y'all's grant got $100 from 100 contributors, then your grant would get like 97% of the matching funds because it, we're optimizing for the preferences of the poor and the many instead of the rich and the few. So it's the, the mathematically optimal way to fund public goods in a democratic 
a democratic community because we're optimizing for the preferences of the many instead of the the rich few. And so that's why uh, Gitcoin grants, when you give only a dollar, the match multiple can be really significant. It gets people over the free rider problem of why would I fund this public good that I'm already getting for free? Well, the reason why you would bother to take out your wallet and give a dollar is that for the projects that have the broadest base of support, the highest number of contributors, uh, a $1 contribution can be matched with 200, 300, 500 dollars. So the match multiples get quite insane once the matching pools get big and the projects get a high number of contributors. And that's what gets people over the free rider problem of contributing on Gitcoin grants. So um, basically, uh, don't get scared off by the math. If you go to, if you read the paper, there's a bunch of Greek symbols and in math and everything like that. But basically, it's just a matching campaign where we match the number of contrib based off the number of contributors instead of the amount funded, and uh, that creates more democracy, pushes power to the edges in ecosystem funding. So uh, Gitcoin grants is primarily doing quadratic funding on a main Ethereum matching pool. Right now, uh, the last matching pool in grants round 12 in December 2021 was a million dollars. But now we've started to add these little adjacent pools for Uniswap and for Polygon and other ecosystems that also are trying to build their own ecosystems, public goods. And quadratic funding is just kind of the formula that gets people to actually get off the couch in a metaphorical way and contribute to the grants on Gitcoin. Um, and I just want to really quickly say, I know that uh, Aaron McMillan was on your podcast recently and he's running CLR Fund, which is another really promising quadratic funding project out there. And uh, I'm a friend of Aaron's and, and I think that uh, there's multiple implementations of QF. Gitcoin just happens to be the biggest and the earliest. So um, how do you become cyber resistant? I mean, what, what stops people from making multiple accounts and uh, contributing a dollar each from 20 accounts? Yeah, that's a really great question. And that's kind of like the Achilles heel of, of quadratic funding is uh, this thing called civil resistance, which basically is sock puppet resistance. Uh, in that example I gave earlier, which was uh, I have a grant where I've raised $100 from one contributor and you two have raised $100 from 100 contributors and you get way more of the matching pool. What's to stop me as a person who wants to get more of the matching pool from just making up 100 identities and then distributing the funding through that? And that's called the civil resistance problem. And it's actually one of the hardest unsolved problems in the space right now. Imagine an ecosystem in which we can move from these one token, one vote systems, which Vitalik has called plutocratic, to one human, one vote. That's digital democracy if we can move to more one human, one vote type systems. And so it's an unsolved problem. Our approach at Gitcoin is to only deploy as much capital as we can be sure that we can keep the fraud tax low. The fraud tax being defined as the amount of money that gets misallocated due to civil resistance. So there's an impedance matching between the amount of capital that is being deployed and the cost of forgery of all of the accounts on Gitcoin. And our approach is to aggregate civil resistance indicators from proof of humanity, from bright ID, from Idena, from a bunch of different projects that are doing really amazing work in creating these web of trusts in order to create civil resistance. And we aggregate all of those signals and we assign a personhood score to each person on the Gitcoin network. And basically, uh, the, the idea there is that the personhood score is just the cost of forgery of each identity. So if I integrate my, my Gitcoin account with Twitter, maybe that provides 50 cents worth of cost of forgery because Twitter accounts are easy to forge. But proof of humanity, so I'm making up these numbers, uh, but, but, but basically like proof of humanity creates $200 worth of civil resistance, right? So you can give $200 worth of the matching pool to someone who has contributed based off of uh, a proof of humanity link identity. Anyway, so it's this whole rabbit hole of, of how you solve civil resistance. And we're just standing on the shoulders of giants by integrating with other civil resistance mechanisms in the space. And uh, it's an unsolved problem. I would not represent that we have solved it, but Gitcoin Grants is actually one of the largest data sets in finding and sniffing out civil rings and uh, channeling that information back to proof of humanity and, and bright ID is uh, what Gitcoin DAO and the fraud defense work stream has been working on over the last several rounds. So uh, it is an unsolved problem and I would not represent that we have totally solved it, but we are trying to be responsible in uh, allocating the capital such that the fraud tax is low. And uh, the big end game here is that Gitcoin Grants on, on its face, if you look at it, it looks like a crowdfunding experiment and funding public goods. But if you look at it, if you turn it on its side, it's actually a giant red team, blue team exercise in sniffing out 
Sybil attacks and finding new ways of proofing these Sybil resistance ecosystems. And the end result, hopefully the positive externality of all of this is that we can create Sybil resistance uh, signals for the rest of the ecosystem and move the rest of the ecosystem from one token, one vote to one human, one vote is hope the hopeful eventual outcome of, of all of this. So uh, TLDR, we haven't solved it, but we're trying to take it seriously. And I'm very excited about a world that is more civil resistant. So in a way, um, Gitcoin kind of distributes uh, money to different uh, projects um, by this mechanism. But where does the money come from in the first place? Sure. Yeah, we distribute money. Uh, our, my, 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 my marketing lead has been coaching me. He's like, say that people are getting coins on Gitcoin. So that's like the inverse of distributing money on, on Gitcoin. Um, the, uh, yeah, so people are getting coins from this matching fund that, uh, that basically has been set up at first by the Ethereum Foundation. And what the Ethereum Foundation wanted when they started engaging with Gitcoin grants was, well, A, Vitalik wanted to something that prototyped in the real world, this paper of quadratic funding that he wrote with Glenn, just like, does it even fly? Like, does this thing even take off or does, does it explode on the launch pad? Luckily, the answer is that it does fly. And the um, basically what the Ethereum Foundation wanted was a more organic, decentralized way of allocating funding in their community. So the EF, EF Grants team is, is really amazing and they do such great work in supporting the major players of the ecosystem. But if you're a more up and coming person who is not well connected in the space, quadratic funding is a better way to get on the radar uh, because we can do thousands of grants on Gitcoin via the matching pool, whereas a centralized grants team can only process on the order of tens of applications per month. So it augments traditional grant funding mechanisms for the EF. And that's that's why through rounds one through six, we run these rounds every quarter, rounds one through six, Gitcoin grants was funded by the Ethereum Foundation. And then a really interesting thing happened in the summer of 2020, DeFi summer, uh, Andre from Yearn Finance, which I don't know if you all remember DeFi Summer, but Andre was like the ultimate Chad during DeFi Summer because he had just launched Yearn and Fair launched it and gave it all away. And um, he announced that he was giving 150K to the Gitcoin Grants matching pool and funding Gitcoin Grants round seven. And I think over the next... 24 hours, I raised maybe like $1.5 million just on Twitter DMs because everyone wanted to do what Andre was doing. It was DeFi summer and he was the ultimate alpha nerd. Um, and so we had this like impedance or this like this phase change where we went from being funded by the Ethereum Foundation to being funded by the DeFi projects that were taking off in the Ethereum space and now had these large treasuries. And some of them are even alumni of Gitcoin grants. Like you're in finance, raised money in the bear market through Gitcoin grants. So we see this, like people graduating into becoming alumni of Gitcoin and then paying it forward to the back of the space, back to the space. And like, you know, arguably they're doing it for karma, but also maybe they get some sort of brand equity out of, hey, we're funding public goods in the Ethereum space. Come work at, at, at Yearn or Uniswap or uh, a Chainlink has been an amazing funder for us. Badger Finance has done some really great stuff for us. And so we, we call this the Funders League. It's a group of projects that is now funding the Ethereum ecosystem that are alumni of Gitcoin grants. And um, and and so uh, that that's rounds. So we've done 12 rounds of Gitcoin grants, one through six with the Ethereum Foundation, seven through 10 were the DeFi uh, projects. And then uh, round 11, NFTs were taking off. And so me and my buddy Austin Griffith launched this uh, PFP project called Moonshot Bots, which are like these little pixelated robots that uh, we put them on a bonding curve and we just sent 100% of the money to public goods. <laughs> we raised $3 million for the, the batching pool, which is just like, I just can't believe how successful that campaign was uh, funding public goods with NFTs. And the crazy thing is that the Moonshot bots have been live on the Gitcoin site on the Avatar Builder for like two years and no one cared until they were NFTs. So uh, there's some like, there's like, you know, like those clickbait articles where they're like, do X with one weird trick. It was like fun public goods with one weird trick and NFTs were a new way of funding public goods. Um, so, um, so, so that's another way that we've been funding the matching pool. And then uh, we just announced this thing called Gitcoin Aqueducts, which is basically like, you know, in ancient Rome, aqueducts were a way of, of carrying liquidity from one location to another. Um, a Gitcoin Aqueduct is just a way of carrying liquidity from your protocol or ecosystem into the Gitcoin Grants matching pool. And typically the way that is set up is that we will run... Uh, 
quadratic funding rounds for your ecosystem if you set up an aqueduct to the matching pool for Gitcoin. So a typical split is like 60-40. 60% of those funds will be used to build your ecosystem and 40% will be used for the Ethereum main round. And um, and so an aqueduct is is a way of, of funding Gitcoin grants. But also if you're a DeFi project that's looking for more bottoms up organic growth, then quadratic funding is like the magic way to do that. So aqueducts are a way of doing it. Anyway, TLDR answer to your question. At first it was the Ethereum Foundation, then it was all the DeFi projects, then it was NFTs, now it's aqueducts. We're basically trying to innovate and find new ways of funding public goods at Gitcoin. That's the other side of the coin. Um, and Right now, the matching pool has on the order of like 10 or $12 million in it. So even if the market turns really bearish, we've got at least four or five more rounds at $3 million per round funded on Gitcoin grants. So we're staying ahead of the problem as, as much as we can. And um, yeah, I'd love to talk about Gitcoin DAO a little bit later, but they're actually doing most of the heavy lifting on, on raising money for the matching pool now. And they have governance rights over the funds so uh, they're doing a really amazing job of, of staying ahead of, of keeping the matching pool funded. That's really impressive. Uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for explaining like how, how, how the quadratic uh, uh, funding mechanism works uh, in, in detail. Um, I'm, so earlier we were talking about the, uh, you know, the, metrics, um, the metrics by which you measure the success of Gitcoin. And one of the things that I, I think a lot about when uh, you know, considering the success of like these new innovative use cases that crypto has enabled is like how much of that has leaked into the non crypto world. And you, you, we were also talking about just the, the amount of value that's created in, you know, open source software. How much, how much of that are you seeing? Like, how, how is, is the, is the quadratic funding model or the Gitcoin model, you know, starting to leak into you know, other areas of open source software that aren't you know, necessarily crypto focused? Uh, or, and, and is there an aspect of Gitcoin success and that has that is specific to crypto and the projects that the, that that it is funding and the fact that there's you know sort of intrinsic economic value inside those projects in the form of tokens or whatever? I guess my question is, does Gitcoin and quadratic funding, uh, such as you've implemented it, scale outside of crypto? Yeah, really great question. I think that the end game here is quite large. If we are able to prototype new ways of funding public goods in the Ethereum ecosystem, then we could backport those to other digital public goods, and then we could backport those to more physical public goods. And what if we've discovered more efficient, more fair, credibly neutral ways of allocating capital, and we could transport those to the world? I think the honest answer to your question, Sebastian, is that I, 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 we haven't proven it out, um, and I, I don't think that we really know yet. But there are some early promising signs during coronavirus, uh, when uh, downtown, Bo I'm from Colorado, and downtown Boulder, Colorado was just shuttered after the coronavirus pandemic when everything went into lockdown. And we, I got together with Katie Johnson and Zach Herring, who are two of my uh, compatriots from Consensus, my Consensus days. Uh, we've since spun out of consensus, but uh, Katie and, and Zach are, are friends that I shared an office with. And I was like, let's do a quadratic funding matching round for downtown Boulder. And we did. And we raised 50K for downtown Boulder businesses that were affected by the pandemic. Now, having a living down, livable downtown is a public good, just like open source software is a public good. And I'm really proud to say that we implemented, so it was called Downtown Stimulus, and it was a quadratic funding matching campaign that just like accepted credit cards, no crypto, not even in the back end, no, not even crypto in the back. And we raised $50,000 50, for, for businesses in downtown Boulder. And I'm really proud to say that we had hundreds of contributions from people who weren't even on email lists. We're, we're kind of like not even comfortable with, with digital experiences. Like just, this is like an e-commerce flow is, is, you know, say in the same user experience, give $1 and get tens or hundreds of dollars in matching. And so downtown stimulus was a great success. And I'm really proud that we prototyped to that. Uh, we've not done another downtown stimulus because Gitcoin needed to focus on the Ethereum space, but I'm, I'm proud that we uh, that we put that model out there. So that's experiment number one, which shows, I think, promise that quadratic funding could go more mainstream. And then experiment number two is that in May of 2021, uh, Gitcoin got together with Open Collective, which is a prominent Web2 open source funding tool and launched fundoss.org, which is a quadratic funding tool for mainstream open source software, things like NPM, or in the Python ecosystem. And we were able to raise 
100k for the web2 open source ecosystem. So I'm I'm really proud to say that the psychology of quadratic funding works whether you put it on crypto rails or fiat rails and I do think that we've prototyped a fundamentally new way of 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 funding public goods uh you know then to be clear it's Glenn and Vitalik's idea I'm just like the guy who's bringing it to one of the one of the people who's bringing it to the Ethereum ecosystem and I do think that there's a lot of promise in in piloting new ways of creating regenerative finance in the web3 ecosystem and then backporting them to the real world and I am I'm, my big hope is that Gitcoin is just kind of like the tip of the sphere what we do in the Ethereum ecosystem um we're actually launching this this uh grant protocol, which is like an infinitely forkable version of Gitcoin grants. And my big dream is that people take it and they go fund uh, digital journalism ecosystems, or they go fund climate change, or they go fund their downtowns. And I think that like copy what we're doing in the Ethereum ecosystem and let's let a thousand experiments blossom in funding public goods elsewhere in the ecosystem is, is kind of what I would hope that Gitcoin's legacy is when I look back on it in 10 or 20 years. And um, there's early signs that it, that it's going to work really well, but I don't think that we've totally proven it out. And and to be clear, the civil resistance problem is is real. We need to solve that. We need to solve the problem of how we fund these matching pools at scale. Um, and and those are the largest unsolved problems that I've got my sights set on right now is is scaling this thing and bringing it to new verticals. So uh, we don't the the TLDR answer, is, Sebastian, is that we don't know, but there's promising signs. What's the biggest challenge in terms of attracting funding? So like, you know, there, especially I think in the crypto space where there are like VC funds and companies and, and DAOs that have gotten um, maybe in that order, you know, that have gotten uh, quite, quite, quite wealthy from, uh, from crypto. And, you know, arguably lots of the portfolio companies of VCs and like even the companies that they fund themselves that also have gotten quite wealthy are, are using open source technology and What's the challenge in getting more funding coming from these organizations? And, uh, you know, how, how do we sort of like encourage uh, sort of wealthy actors in the space to uh, contribute more to open source infrastructure funding? It's a really great question. And I think the answer is that it depends on the audience. I believe that, I mean, Gitcoin grants were funded like four or six rounds ahead of right now. And it's really been, I'm so thankful that the community has rallied around our mission and rallied around our project. And I'm just so heartened to see that as the community gets more rich, as the Ethereum ecosystem advances, that they're funding uh, Gitcoin grants. And I do think that, um, you know, it, it, it really, the, you know, the, the, a naive approach to the to the crypto space might be that, oh, it's all degens and it's all selfishness. And um, and and I just don't think that that's true. I, I see uh, us as the tip of the sphere for regenerative crypto economics and um, the, the type of people that, that realize that like, hey, what's the value of a Lambo if the sky is on fire? We're really all on this earth together and we're all in these ecosystems together. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that our common spaces and our communities are livable and are supporting new people coming into them and innovation. And so, you know, the people who who really get that message, I think that we've found a lot of luck in making sure that they are funding public goods. But, you know, part part of what we're trying to do is, is show people that it does work, that you can have positive sum games with crypto economics, even in an adversarial environment. And I think showing people that it's possible is is the beginning of educating them that uh, there are mechanisms for making the world better and for making these these ecosystems better. And um, you know the, the big the big challenge is that if there's a giant hack, actually I'll just, I'll just the open SSL bug that happened in 2013. Uh, there's this bug called Heartbeat Heartbleed, which basically open SSL was dumping the it, open SSL runs every SSL connection on, on the internet, the little lock in your browser that shows you your website is secure is OpenSSL. And the OpenSSL Foundation runs on less than a million dollars per year in donations and just contract work. And there was a bug in OpenSSL that dumped all of the contents of your web server to the memory to the open internet, which for those of you who aren't even security minded, like that's a bad thing. You don't want your secure server dumping the contents of its memory to the open internet. And it's because the OpenSSL Foundation didn't, have like funding to work on this thing that was a pillar of the entire internet. And so when a black swan event like that happens, people understand the need to fund infrastructure and to fund our public goods. And um, the whole point is like, 
getting people to a point where they'll fund public goods even without those black swan events. And I think that uh, it's creating that social awareness of those things is is like point number one. Point number two is education, which like, thank you for having me on the podcast so that we could talk about this thing. And then three is like, we wanna make public goods cool. Uh, I think that I'm so lucky that Vitalik Buterin, who's the alpha nerd of the Ethereum ecosystem, cares so much about public goods. And that creates a social sort of consensus that funding public goods is cool. and it, it up, ups your sort of like social status to fund public goods. And I think we want to create that that kind of like that social hierarchy where people who are giving back to the world it is 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 something that's seen as as a something that's socially acceptable and even socially promotable. And um, you know, I, I think that uh, in a, in the Ethereum ecosystem where money is, there's everyone's like 10 X richer than they were a year and a half ago. It's been much easier than it is in like communities where you're really struggling. You you need a philanthropist or like the government to fund a quadratic funding matching pool in those types of communities. But at least in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, I, we're starting to see some really promising signs that people want to fund these, these ecosystems. So a lot of traction, but I think it's an unsolved problem. How has this worked in the OSS and uh, downtown Boulder cases? I mean, who who um who gave money for the matching pool? In downtown stimulus, I went to uh, I went to a couple wealthy venture capitalists slash funders that have either invested in Gitcoin, invested in my past projects, or just that I've known for a, a decade. Um, and they were funding the matching pool. Uh, Brad Feld it has been an inspiration of me. He's a prominent local venture capitalists and he funded a lot of the matching pool. And then uh, the Gitcoin Grants matching pool funded some of it. And in the fund OSS case, uh, Pia Mancini has been building Web2 open source ecosystems and has a lot of connections to tech giants that that give back on Open Collective. And so she funded part of the matching pool. And then there was also uh, members of the Gitcoin Grants Funders League that funded the matching pool. So it was just kind of leveraging my reputation and the Gitcoin traction in order to create a pilot. And then, you know, the idea is that once you have a pilot and you've proven that the model works, then you can then go to local governments and people who are more risk averse and and sell it to them. So, uh, yeah, that's how we solved it in the past. But I think in the future, a more systematic model is is probably needed if we're going to scale these things. I want to I want to come back to to the public good funding uh, aspect for a moment and, and sort of the parallels I see between like open source public goods and the sort of like physical public goods. So like you know the, I think the Heartbleed uh, example is a great example of you know underfunded software that is really underpinning like the entire internet infrastructure. And like you know if you look at say a country like the United States where it's you know generally accepted like the infrastructure there is falling apart and like you know lots of lots of investment was made in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and like not so much in the last you know four or five decades um, that infrastructure is starting to fall apart. Uh, I had this you, you, on one of your blog posts you had this like really cool kind of illustration of like all the blocks that build up to like you know that web3 wallet that you're using or whatever and like underneath it it's all just like lib p2p and tcp ip right. but so is there a risk that at some point like our our you know core internet infrastructure which by the way was funded like very much by by governments like by the US government you know, you know through the second half of the 20th century you know is there a risk that that infrastructure starts falling apart because of lack of funding or you know, is, is it is it stable enough? Or, you know, like what what's the risks here that that um, come into play with regards to like this kind of fundamental core infrastructure, whether it's you know uh, um, OpenSSL or other other software? Yeah, I think that that illustration that you're talking about had a bunch of like little blocks that everything relies on. At the top of it is like your bags, you know, like all of your crypto assets that you rely on are just funded by this this these, this like hodgepodge of open source projects. Um, and it's like, it's scary to have that much economic value relying on something that is, is underfunded. And, and I think that the answer, uh, to your question is that we're, you know, people are talking about the metaverse a, a lot in the, in the ecosystem, you know, since Zuck launched meta and there's a big question about 
well, you know, is 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 the infrastructure of the metaverse going to be owned free and open source? And is it going to be a public good or is it all going to be like Facebook's infrastructure? And, you know, in, in like the end game there is like, are we all going to be stuck being tracked by Zuck and like have ads everywhere in the metaverse versus is it going to be more of like a public good where you own your digital experience in a world increasingly intermediated by digital software? Who runs the code that? intermediates your experience with the world. And I think that if we want to move to a more free, open uh, society that encourages human fr- uh, human thriving and human flourishing, that we want to have a world in which the software that it intermediates our experiences in the metaverse is free and open and that you can fork it if you disagree with it. And that's the vision of the metaverse that I want to see. Um, you know, and I'm not my, even much of a gamer. I just like, I just think that increasingly humanity's experiences are, are intermediated by software and I want that to be free and open source software. So, um, you know, that's one angle on it. I think that that's one reason why it's important to fund our digital infrastructure. Uh, I think that we're seeing a world in which warfare is increasingly conducted online via cyber attacks. And so, you know, there's like a national defense public good sort of reason why we would want to shore up our infrastructure. And and I think that that's another argument for it. And then the third argument is just like sheer scale. When we when TCP IP was first designed, which is a very elegant and anti-fragile protocol, it really, it's, it's just grown several orders of magnitude since it was originally designed. And making sure that our digital infrastructure is anti-fragile instead of fragile, I think, is in the public's best interest. And so, um, you know, there was a sense of civic pride in my grandparents and in great parents generation in which they were building digital infrastructure after World War II. And I really hope to see a reprisal of that around global citizenship and um, the public good uh, for all of humanity and human thriving. And, you know, I'm getting into like a little bit more of my like hippy dippy side right here. But but I do think that there's a strong rationalist case for funding public goods and digital infrastructure. But I, in the, until we make it cool until we make being an internet citizen and and funding public goods cool we're never going to solve these global coordination problems like climate change and digital infrastructure and cyber attacks and all of this kind of stuff and so uh the world that i want to live in is the one where we've solved those coordination failures but i i think that we have to create a social consensus and inter, inter subjective consensus that not only that we can do it and that we should do it. And, and that's, that's a lot of what my work is, is raising awareness of these problems. Even when we, when we think that we should do it, public goods funding is notoriously difficult because it's actually several problems rolled into one, right? So basically you have to decide right. what should be achieved, how should one try to achieve it, who should achieve it. And so all of this kind of has to be uh, kind of determined. There has to be some consensus on this. And then basically, then you need to f- the funds and you need to distribute the funds and so on. But actually, um, and I mean, to combat this problem, I think sometime last year, um, Vitalik uh, he published a blog post about um, uh, retroactive funding, right? So basically, so, so that would basically... Um, allocate funding after the end has already been achieved and would thus make um, make funding these in the first place a little bit of a venture game kind of kind of like to, to interest like the the, the, the the crowd that that uh, actually has pretty good experience at funding a very risky startups yeah startups and other ventures yeah so ha- what do you make of this? Well, uh, so the idea behind retroactive public goods funding is to create an exit for teams that work on public goods. So, you know, if you built Lib to P2P and that's now underpinning the entire digital infrastructure or maybe OpenSSL, we should stick with that example because we talked about it earlier, then basically give those people an exit and give them like, I don't know, a $10 million or a $100 million outcome for building that infrastructure. And then what that does is that it creates a market for venture capitalists to come in and seed fund public goods projects because they're expensive expecting that that outcome uh, they're making a rational economic game that they could create that outcome. And you create the sea change where now all of this apparatus that's only focused on projects that capture value can now be all of that energy and all of that human innovation 
that that has been focused on capturing value in the past can just be focused on creating value without having to worry about capturing it. And that's the end game of retroactive public goods funding. I am very bullish on retroactive public goods funding. And as I do more things with Gitcoin, I'm actually realizing that quadratic funding is just one tool in the tool belt. There's plenty of other really great ways to fund the commons and to fund public goods. And I envision uh, this core primitive of an impact DAO, which creates positive externalities for the world. And if we just stack impact DAO on impact DAO, then we're gonna create more and more public goods funding. And some of them will have, uh, their mechanism will be retroactive public goods funding. On other of them, it'll be quadratic funding. And then there'll be other mechanisms like proof of humanity, I think is an impact DAO. And we just stack those things on top of each other until we create this regenerative crypto economic infrastructure for the world. And it's gonna be emergent. To your point, like we need to create the magic of quadratic funding is that it doesn't matter what me, Kevin Owaki, the original founder of Gitcoin's values are. We're building a mechanism that is a channel for greater combinations of intelligence and strength to come together. And it is the inner subjective consensus of the Ethereum community that is represented on Gitcoin. So it's not my opinion that's that's represented. We're just building a more perfect channel for for value signal value signals to be to be created. And so I think it's like when you stack all of those impact DAOs on top of each other, you get the inner subjective consensus of humanity of which coordination problems and public goods problems need to be solved. And, and I think that that's the real, the real end game. And, and as you're right, you're right, it's multiple problems in one. It's what, what do people actually care about and how much do they care about it and in what directions. And it's creating a way where the values of, of what do we care about and what do we want to support is aggregated and, and supported is the infrastructure that I think is, is being built in this space. And that's what makes me really bullish for regenerative crypto economics. Let's talk about impact DAOs and regenerative uh, crypto economics. So you've you've actually said uh, uh, impact DAOs several times now, Kevin. So now explain it, please. Yeah, so um, basically uh, an impact DAO is any DAO that has a positive externality for humanity. And I think that that can be on many vectors. Like Gitcoin's positive impact is that it creates public goods funding. Uh, proof of humanities positive impact is that it creates civil resistance in the ecosystem. Uh, ClimaDAO, which is a DAO that's working on making sure that carbon credits are well-funded, its positive externality is more pressure on carbon, ca uh, more economic incentive to create carbon capture mechanisms, which hopefully means more car carbon capture and solves climate change. So um, impact DAO is just, the low, is just a definition of something that creates a positive externality for the world without being prescriptive about what type of positive externality. And, you know, think of it like ERC-20. ERC-20 is this token standard that you can build a, a utility token on, you can build a governance token, you can build securities on top of ERC-20. Um, and it's just, that's the lowest common denominator of how you create a token. Um, Impact DAO is just the lowest common denominator of any DAO that creates a positive externality for the world. And um, the reason why it's important to define that is that if you've got a stack of impact DAOs, of, of which there are already dozens, um, then what you're basically, over time as you start, like think of them as like money Legos. And if you just start to stack these DAOs on top of each other, what the aggregation of that is a regenerative crypto economic infrastructure for humanity. Remember, this is all being built on Ethereum and adjacent Web3 protocols that are transparent, immutable, global and programmable substrate for human coordination. And we could export so much human thriving for the world if these things hit web scale. So it's about innovating new mechanisms and funding sources that create positive externalities for humanity, a plurality of them, not just quadratic funding, and then stacking them all on top of each other and creating a regenerative crypto economic infrastructure for the world. And that is my, my hope that the legacy of the uh, crypto economic uh, movement is is that we have created a system that is more efficient way of funding public goods and creating human thriving than the old nation state industrial infrastructure that existed before. And maybe, you know, it's not zero sum, maybe they augment each other and, and work together in order to create more human thriving. But I see that elegant mechanism design on top of these coordination substrates that are Web3 is there's like just a ton of like high upside for humanity if if we continue to stack impact owls on top of each other and and create that infrastructure for the world and and I'm just really bullish to see all of this starting to come together. 
Kevin, let's let's make this more concrete. So basically, um, there's also this book that you co-authored with a couple of people, the Green Pill book. Um, so basically, um, it talks about uh, regenerative crypto economics, and it's it's actually it's a really um, I don't want to say it's a read because there's a lot of pictures in it. It's it's very it's very fast read. I mean, it's very information. It's very idea dense. But basically, the recurring theme of that book is um, combating coordination failures, right? So, and um, basically, the uh, these impact DAOs, those are means of doing so. So, can you give us examples of um, where in the in in the world we live in we see coordination failures and how how they basically fail us as um, humanity? Yeah, real quick plug for the book. Uh... I created a book uh, that's really, like as you said, a quick read and basically aggregates much smarter people than me. The Vitalics of the world, the Bologies of the world, the Glenn Wiles of the world takes their, their ideas and puts them in a very comprehensible format for people who are entering the space and want to solve regenerative crypto economics. And I'm standing on the shoulders of giants by exporting the the ideas of Michael Zargum and Glenn Weil and all these people to the world. And, you know, as you said, the, these this is an aggregation of, of other people's ideas and I would not be there without them. But um, to actually answer your question, uh, coordination failures are any situation in which there's a dictatorless dystopia, a, a, a system in which every single person hates the system, but for lack of a better mechanism for coordination, it endures. So another an example of that it, that's more tangible than say open source is let's like an over overfishing example. Uh, so basically like if the three of us are all sitting around a lake and we can all make a thousand dollars, actually no wait, this is a podcast about crypto. So we can all make a thousand die per month by fishing out of that pond. But um, one of us can make a thousand and 500 die by overfishing that pond and the result is that the other people only make 900 die per month then basically what you get is you get a coordination failure where every individual's individual incentive is to overfish the pond and the rational economic behavior is to is to overfish the pond until the pond is completely barren and none of us can make any money out of that pond anymore. So you get this like death spiral of, oh, we didn't coordinate to agree not to over consume this resource. And therefore, no, none of us have access to the resource. So it's a dictatorless dystopia in which each of us hates that system. But for lack of a better coordination mechanism, it endures. That's a like a game theoretic example. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what I see when I look at climate change. We all have a rational economic incentive to uh, fly across the world and do business. And we externalize harm to the world. Um, we all have a rational economic incentive to free ride on open source software, despite the burden that that places on our digital infrastructure and on open source software maintainers. And for lack of a better coordination mechanism, it endures. Well, now we've got a global, transparent, immutable, programmable substrate for human coordination, Ethereum, Cosmos, uh, you know, all of these different blockchains. So now we've got a like this this amazing substrate for for coordination where we can build these coordination games and solve coordination failures by creating these coordination games. And so um, the end game of the book is just to tell people, like teach the game theory of coordination and to tell them that better infrastructure is possible if if we just choose it. And and so, you know, this is basically the opportunity that I see is just educating thousands and tens of thousands of, of young people who, who are maybe lacking hope or maybe lacking education about how we can solve these coordination failures. And I, and I see this, like, I hope that 30 years from now, this is the legacy of the Web3 ecosystem, is that we uh, bootstrapped this decentralized finance thing. But uh, maybe that was just the bootloader for a more regenerative infrastructure for humanity long term. And, you know, I know you asked me for tangible examples. So I'll go go back from like the beautiful language and talk about tangible examples. But you know, Gitcoin is building public goods funding mechanisms for the world, uh, which can be used for funding downtowns that are affected by COVID or funding digital infrastructure or funding journalism. Uh, I think that Bright ID and and Proof of Humanity and all these different identity mechanisms exporting civil resistance for the world would create a lot of a lot of positive externality around identity, moving us from one token, one vote systems to one human, one vote systems. And by the way, there's already people in Argentina, hundreds of them that just live off of proof of humanity and UBI. 
and that creates better circumstances for them locally. Uh, I think ClimaDAO in the fact that they have are using crypto economics to create more demand for carbon credits is an amazing example of using Ethereum to solve climate change. And um, and you know by the way, when proof of stake happens and we're all of a sudden using 99.99% less energy, there's going to be a huge sea change in the perception of these systems to create positive externalities for humanity. And I hope that climate change is one of the first things that builders in this space start to try to solve from there. So those are some tangible examples, but there's likely dozens others that that uh, that, that we could go through if you want more tangible examples. And I hope to be invited back to Epicenter in four years again, and we can talk about uh, hundreds of tangible examples at that point. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, um, you know, certainly, hopefully, we'll have you on before that. <laughs> but uh, so I'd like to talk about. Uh, so earlier, we mentioned that you were a member of the of the Gitcoin DAO. Uh, you, you is you know expressed that you didn't want to be called the CEO of the Gitcoin DAO, and that, that's fine. I think we could just call you like some some guy in the Gitcoin DAO. Yeah, citizen, internet citizen. Right. Yeah. So what's the like? You know. You know, it seems natural for for Gitcoin to uh, like transform into a DAO, but uh, tell us a bit about that process and like, you know, what is the what is the vision here for for the DAO? Totally. Um, well, I made a big mistake when I first started Gitcoin, which is that we made it centralized to start, and you know, the tools didn't really exist uh, back then to make it into a DAO or make it decentralized. Much to the disgust of the people on Twitter who were responding to the to, yeah. to my question about what we should talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like hand, like hand to the air. If you're watching the video, you see my hand in the air. Like I pledge guilty. We we built it centralized. Like I'm guilty. I'm. I'm sorry. I wish I hadn't done that also. Um, and and that's a big problem. And I think coming to grips to that has been a lot of the story for me over the last two years is that you can't have a centralized uh, funding infrastructure for a decentralized ecosystem or for a decentralized world. And, um, you know, I, I think that the ecosystem deserves credible neutrality. They deserve to know that uh, I'm not the ones with my hands on the lever of governance of Gitcoin and that the community should be in charge of the governance of Gitcoin. And so the launch of Gitcoin DAO was basically the imbuing of governance rights for how these quadratic funding matching pools are allocated, what are the rules of what's acceptable in them into a governance token called GTC, which stands for Gitcoin, or I like to say it stands for Grow the Community. Um, and and basically the idea is we are, we're turning an apple into an orange right now. We are turning a centralized company into a DAO, um, or at least we're turning the grants portion of, of our assets into, into Gitcoin DAO. And the whole idea is basically that um, uh, no company should own this infrastructure. It should be a credibly neutral DAO that's governed by the community that it serves. And that was the idea behind Gitcoin DAO. We launched it on May 25th, 2021, which is a day that will change the trajectory of Gitcoin forever. We draw, uh, we dropped 18 uh, GTC to 18,000 different members of the community and um, basically allowed them to delegate to different members of the Gitcoin community uh, to what we called stewards. So basically there's a big problem with uh, governance tokens where everyone wants to govern things in theory, but in principle, no one ever votes on anything. So we made everyone delegate to people who would actually be involved and would help govern Gitcoin when they first got their, their uh, tokens, which I think was an innovative way of making sure there was 100% consent of the governed. Uh, you know, other DAOs have like three to 5% voter turnout. Gitcoin DAO regularly gets 80 or 90% voter turnout because we've got these like delegated people, stewards that are aggregating the consent of the governed and participating in governance votes. And so um, that was like our primary innovation on governance for, for Gitcoin DAO. Uh, was making was having that delegation layer that was 100% represented at the start. And ENS has since copied our, our DAO delegation mechanism. I'm very proud to have pushed this space forward in very, like one small way there. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so we've uh, decentralized the governance of Gitcoin DAO and the surface area of that governance will increase as we launch a credibly neutral protocol for quadratic funding and move all of the funding mechanisms from the centralized platform over to the protocol over hopefully the next 18 months. I'm like kicking the engineers under the table to to tell be able to tell me that it's going to be sooner than that. But um, uh, but yeah, so decentralize the governance, then decentralize the computation and the economics of the network, and then I can have the feather in my cap and respond to those people on Twitter that uh, are accusing me of being centralized, which is totally true right now. So um, yeah, TLDR can't have a centralized intermediary doing public goods funding for a decentralized ecosystem, and that's why we're moving a lot of these assets into the DAO. 
That's super cool. Um, now I'm afraid to check the Twitter thread. I'm probably g- getting hated on for being centralized. No, m- most of the most of the most of the responses were uh, were were really really positive, and um, you know we've covered a lot of it here. So this this idea of of like the you know the problem with with governance, as you mentioned, like I think you accurately put it that everybody wants to govern, but nobody actually ends up governing. Do you think that the solution ultimately is delegation? Because that seemed like to me, it's sort of it's sort of like uh, analogous to, uh, you know, the current um, system of governance that we have, like in, um, in like, you know, just our regular politics, which ends up creating all these negative externalities, like career politicians and like, you know, corruption and stuff like that. And like, you know, recently in the, recently in the cosmos community, like there was this kind of uproar about like some governance votes that, you know, may have been influenced by like some community members, et cetera. And yeah, I think we see this thing, you know, once in a while in the crypto space. Are there other solutions to this? Like how, how do we get people more engaged? Like, I mean, like a simple thing could just be like, you get a, you get a notification on your phone when there's something to vote on. You just like vote on it there on the spot. Like what are other solutions to like this delegation? Right. Well, I think that's a really great question. And I think that we should not shy away from these hard problems. Uh, the, the problem with the notification on the phone is that, OK, well, now you're notified that you have to vote, but you have to actually expend the mental computational cycles to understand the problem and to vote, which like, you know, you're sitting there laying like watching Netflix and you get a notification that you have to vote on something. You're like, oh, like another thing for my to do list. Um so I don't know, like, I think it's an unsolved problem and I'm, I'm supportive of seeing people innovate on, on that problem. Um, the important thing for me was that the, um, the community's consent of the consent of the governed from like political theory is the only legitimate basis for, for governance, um, as opposed to like the divine right of Kings, which is what, you know, in like old, like old times, uh, where, where the legitimacy of the governed came from. And, and I do think that, you know, these web three networks that like Gitcoin is a hundred percent Gitcoin grants is for the most, we're, we're trending towards hundred percent consent of the governed because it was the community that allocated their governance vote to community members. And, and I think that that's super important to have those initial starting conditions. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, quadratic voting, uh, which is basically uh, more of a one human, one vote type system, which prevents capture by rich elites, is another area where people are innovating in terms of governance. And I would love to see more experiments in quadratic voting DAOs. I think we'll see those in the next several years. And then the other thing is that, which is a totally different category of governance, is that every time you do a contribution on Gitcoin grants during a matching pool, you're actually don't like... The secret, the secret is going to be out after this podcast comes out, but like you're actually governing where the matching pool goes every time you do a contribution on Gitcoin grants. It just doesn't feel like voting. Um, every time you give a $1 contribution and $500 more of the matching pool goes to a project because of it, like we tricked you, you're governing how the matching pool is distributed there. So um, these systems where there's robust signal already being generated that you can take that signal and channel it into a governance mechanism um, is hopefully an aggregation of the preferences of the community that is being governed. And I think that those are really elegant ways of, of creating governance experiment that like didn't exist in a skeuomorphic old world type way. So um, I guess TLDR, I hear your criticisms, but I think that um, delegation is better than what we had in Web 2. I think quadratic voting is a way to improve on that. And I also think that robust signal generation in like the Gitcoin grants example is another meaningful experiment. And I hope to see 100 experiments blossom that that improve the ability for the consent of the governed to be expressed in a digital way. And that that's the challenge of our generation, I think, is uh, upgrading democracy to be high bandwidth for the next generation. Uh, I think that that's that's like really one of the hugest levers that to make the world better for Gen Z and Gen Alpha as they inherit the world that that we can do. Thank you. That was uh, that was super enlightening. I have one more question that kind of ties in with the last couple of topics uh, before we unfortunately have to wrap, uh, and that's the future of work. So basically, if you look at um, the way that Gitcoin grants and the Gitcoin DAO kind of doles out work to different people. Um, so how, how does this kind of tie in with the notion of the Internet of Jobs that you have publicized elsewhere? And how, how, how does it differentiate itself from, from the concept of a gig economy? I, I think that those answers are really unknown 
so far, but I can provide the way that I think about them, which will hopefully start to create shape for what the Internet of Jobs looks like in the readers or in the listeners' minds. So basically, in the Internet of Money, we have now created the ability for computers to send value across a computer network. Um, and I think that's really exciting because it, re it means that we can reinvent how value is transferred in all segments of society to not need intermediaries. And like, by the way, if you want a preview of how this is going to going to look in 30 years, like just look at the Internet of Information. When we took the computers and we gave them the ability to send information across a computer network and that reinvented entertainment, media, politics, all these things in society that rely on information were rewritten by the Internet. And we have like a 30 year view on what that looks like. And now we have the ability to reinvent value transfer and governance and scarcity in society because computers can now send that across a computer network. And it follows from first principles that we're going to rewrite how the banking system works, which is DeFi, how art auctions work, which is NFTs. But no one, everyone's sleeping on what is the future of work with, with in, and, and I think that we're, we're all kind of like, the, the internet of jobs is basically the design space that I think it happens when um, the 99% of humanity, that their financial lives is not their bank accounts and their investments, but it's how they earn a living. And what happens when that collides with blockchain technology and Web3 era systems around data storage and distributed computation and DAOs and in digital reputation, I think is an important thing here. Um, that, that I think digital reputation is foundational because when I want to make it, like you can't have like a trustless interaction with like an Uber driver. Like when I, when I want to have, when I want to hire someone to take me somewhere, then I need um, an assurance that they're not a creep and they're going to get me there safely. And, um, and, and I think that there's like reputation is a big part of how we do value transfer in, in our lives in, and in so many different places. And so I'm curious to see what markets for doing knowledge work together look like, because the, the Uber, the Uber example is like a very rudimentary example, but, uh, because, because I only really care if it's like they're going to get me there safely and and quickly. But on Gitcoin, when I hire a software engineer, I want to know, like, do they speak the same language as me? Are they in the same time zone? Do they speak the same programming languages? Do they have like a bunch of like uh, communication or like emotional problems? Are they reliable? Do they produce a good code? Are they going to ghost me? Like there's just many more vectors. And I think that reputation matters a lot. And um the way I see this as different than the gig economy is like the gig economy is what jobs look like if you just like bolt an internet of jobs on fiat rails. But now that we have this like open source permissionless blockchain technology to program the way we do value transfer with each other, there's going to be non skeuomorphic ways of doing value transfer with each other that like couldn't have existed in the old world. Skeuomorphism just means like basically it's like native to the new environment as opposed to the new world. Um, and and um, and like I think a great example of that is Coordinate, uh, which is basically a tool where everyone in a DAO votes on whether or not everyone else is doing a good job, and then you drop tokens on the entire set of workers in a DAO. That's an example of a non skeuomorphic use case for the Internet of Jobs is is like creating an intersubjective consensus of people who are working together of what they think of each other, and then allocating tokens based off of that. Um, I think. Paying people in governance rights is another really great example of a non skeuomorphic Internet of Jobs thing that didn't exist in the gig economy. If I pay you in dollars, then like, see ya, you might go away after that. But if I pay you in governance rights for a project that I'm involved in, then you have aligned incentives uh, with me in, in many, many different forms. And so uh, the design space of Internet of Jobs is just basically what happens when money. Uh, the Internet of Money collides with a society uh, that it earns their living as opposed to makes it from investments, makes it off of labor instead of capital. And I think that the huge upside for the blockchain space, by the way, is that 95% of humanity, 99% of humanity, their financial lives is their jobs, not their investments. So you want blockchains to go mainstream, then you need to invest in DAOs and the Internet of Jobs because that's like people don't people are going to work on the financial are going to use 
D apps that have uh, the financial use cases that they care about, that they solve for their job to be done. And, um, and so I think that's what the Internet of Jobs is. And I predict that an upcoming cycle will be around DAOs and Internet of Jobs and future of work. And I think it's only a matter of time. You can make the argument from first principles. Uh, the Internet of Value is reinventing everything in society that has to do with value transfer and jobs has to do with value transfer. So it just follows from first principles to me that we'll see a cycle that is all about the Internet of Jobs in the next several years. I really get the difference, I think, between like the gig economy and the Internet of Jobs and like the, the differences that you have aligned incentives. I think that's one of the main differences in that. And the reputational aspect, I think, plays a huge role, too. Um, you know, reputation is something that's been notoriously hard to figure out on, you know, in, in, in the digital world, especially, I think, in the crypto world. And I think that a lot of people are looking at reputation, at least from my vantage point, as like an objective measure of like some data points that you can get from like, I don't know, Git commits or like, you know, how long you've staked in something or like these sort of very objective measures. But reputation is about so much more than that. It's about like there's there's all the subjective aspect as well. Like you're talking about talking the same language. Well, you know, that that's relative to you, but it might not be relative to like, you know, someone living in France, for instance, or in Germany. Um, how do we how do we? How do we come to terms with those sort of like, you know, of course, you need to have the, repu the, the, the objective things that we can you know, objectively look at and measure. And you can say, hey, like this person has like, you know, so many commits or whatever. And then the, the more subjective aspects, is that something that can be solved uh, in the crypto space or is, it, or is it like a coordination problem that's goes beyond uh, the scope of decentralized reputation? Oh, man, you know, I'm going to tell you that all coordination problems are solvable. That's like. You know, that's yeah, that's course. my whole stick <laughs> is that we can solve these with coordination. Um, uh, no, so I mean, I, I'll take the, your questions in reverse order. We, like, so I think we should move from trying to find the completely rationally objective measure uh, of like reputation, which like appeals to me, by the way, because I'm a software engineer and I love things that are like zeros or ones and they're tangible and like I know what I'm dealing with. Um, I, objectivity is a false idol, though. We want to create an intersubjective consensus of what multiple people think from multiple vantage points. And that is, I think, like once we ri widen the aperture of design to intersubjective consensus to just like totally uh, from totally objective, then I think that that is really what the holy grail is. It's like the, your reputation is the sum of what people think of you around you. That's intersubjective consensus. And, and by the way, the intersubjective consensus I'm trying to create is that coordination failures are solvable. I want to move people from like, oh, we just have to live with this like decaying infrastructure to no, like, no, we can solve it. Like that's the intersubjective consensus I'm trying to create. Um, and, and then the last point I want to make before I kick it back to you is like, who owns the infrastructure is a really big problem here. In, uh, in gig economy, Upwork and LinkedIn own all of our reputation data and, and everything. And who owns the infrastructure in Web3 is super important. I want to be able to take my identity from site to site to site. And I also don't want Upwork taking 10% of my, of my fucking paycheck every month. Like, fuck that. And, and the fact that LinkedIn, the, their whole business model is taking your reputation data and selling it to recruiters. Reed Hoffman makes $30 billion per year off of your fucking data. It's bullshit. And what, that's the, one of the big differences between the internet of jobs and, and the gig economy is that we're going to all own our reputation data and take it from, um, from place to place to place. Um, but anyway, yeah, to actually answer the question you asked me, intersubjective consensus over objective measures, I think, is, is where we're going. Mm. And, and what, one thing that also come, came to mind here when researching this and sort of like reading your, your, your writings on the internet of jobs aspect is, you know, what, what may be some of the negative aspects of moving uh, in this direction as opposed to the sort of traditional uh, employment model that uh, you know, affords people stability, uh, sort of long-term uh, benefits as well, such as retirement or life insurance and you know, sort of immediate things like, uh, like healthcare. Uh, is this something that can be adapted to uh, the Internet of Jobs model? Are we going to start seeing DAOs offering like you know, retirement savings plans and, and healthcare, uh, like healthcare packages for, for its members? Yeah, um, that's an extremely important question. And I think that it's one of the things that really keeps me up at night is um, how much of our legacy, like the industrial age infrastructure, how much social safety net stuff is globbed onto jobs because there's not another better coordination mechanism for it. Um, 
I, I have a family and I want to, I'm, I'm, you know, interested in end of life planning and making sure that my kids have a good education and planning for retirement and creating life insurance and health insurance and all those things. And those things are all just globbed onto jobs in the old world. Um, I'm really excited by what Opolis is doing in basically creating a bridge between the internet of jobs and these social safety things where basically um, what they do is they create a corporation that you work for, that you get uh, your retirement and your life insurance and all that kind of stuff. And they just take a percentage of the earnings that you get from the Dow and pay for those things that way. So that's like a skeuomorphic way of adapting those things to the real world. And so I, I think that the Internet of Jobs absolutely is going to need to have core primitives for how insurance is done, how you plan for retirement, how you save for education, and hopefully reinventing education, by the way, so that it's not just like, you know, $45,000 per year to get an education out of college. I think that, you know, the, there's a ton of debt that's globbed onto the old system. And I think that unwinding that for the next generation is is really important. Um, in the US, but like the more I mean, macro- Many parts of the world do actually have this. So basically, I I, I, I mean, this is this is a very US-centric point of view, right? So basically I'm German. I went to, I went to, I got a perfectly good ed- education here. I went to university and I, I, I did not pay anything. Actually, basically, if if you go to university and your parents don't have enough money to uh, to to fund your uh, to to fund your living costs, you you just get a loan from the government. You have to pay back half at zero interest, and it's capped at I think sixteen thousand euros. Um, so one six. Uh, so basically, I mean, I mean, this is this is it's it it's in parts of the world this exists, right? So basically, it it shows that that. Um, it's it's not a utopian vision. I mean, it can be done, and in many parts of the world, it is. Totally, yeah. And I'll just note that um, I am an imperfect vessel for a lot of these uh, conversations. But what we did do is we just created an intersubjective consensus, like you from Europe and me from America, about what this could look like. And and I think that that's completely valid. There's also probably you know the infrastructure. I can't speak to in Asia or South America uh, what it looks like as well. Um, but I guess like one last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, like one of the things I think the big, ri- the big risks of this space is that if you build the optal si- optimal signal generation mechanism for what people value, what do we do if we build the perfect channel for people to express their preferences and they have shitty preferences? <laughs> like what if you don't want to save for education or health insurance? Like I, I don't know what you do then other than, you know, invest in education and risk management and social safety nets um, from an infrastructure level. And then you get into complicated questions about like, should we coerce people into into saving for education or retirement? And and I haven't figured out the like, what do we do if if like you build the signal generation mechanism and people have uh, values that are like I haven't I haven't worked out that part of the equation yet. So. The, the, that's those are kind of my thoughts on the subject, but I think that it's an unsolved problem. Yeah, and there's certainly like some non skeuomorphic, you know, uh, like uh, paradigm shifts that that are meant to happen there. So you know, if you know, th- does 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 funding education in 20 years from now, like if you're working for a DAO, like you know, does that look the same as what it looks like now? Does saving for retirement look the same? Like you know, healthcare, what does that look like? So uh, I yeah, mean, I there's also, there's also different uh, levels here, right? I mean, so basically, there's things that kind of pertain to yourself and your own future. But saving for education typically actually uh, pertains to your kids futures, or at least, you know, the younger generation. So I feel like, um, you, I mean, if you suffer from your own bad choices, okay, that's too bad. If your kids suffer from your bad choices, I think to me, that's a different story. Sure. Yeah, one of the um, one of the the sort of ideas that's in the book, which I originally got from Yancy Strickler, the founder of Kickstarter, is this idea of bentoism, which is how do we move from uh, a financial system that prioritizes instant gratification to um, which is now me, uh, which is like to to the group, which is now us. So how do we move from what's good for me now to what's good for 
everyone, everyone now, or like my family now. Um, and then the other vector is futures, which is basically like, how do we move from now me to future me? And then like you make, you make that into a four by four matrix and it's now me, now us, future us and future me. And so how do we build a financial system that like passes the marshmallow test of, of basically, you know, how do we plan into the future and how do we plan for the group instead of the individual? And I think that the that's just like a lens that you could look through the design of re regenerative crypto economics uh and, and and like by the way like it'd be hard to do worse than the old finance like at least in the united states we have this quarterly earnings cycle and all of these like executives are just focused on their next quarterly earnings cycle and uh you know i think it'd be hard to do worse than that in in the crypto ecosystem hopefully we can build better primitives for coordination that that can plan further out for existential risks that don't fit into the quarterly the quarterly cycle, like say climate change or digital infrastructure. Yeah, I think I think somehow it's really difficult to kind of straddle the gap between what we think is right and what is generally done and accept, accepted and not questioned. So, I mean, basically, I mean, Kevin, you also have kids. So basically, you will also know this. They will ask you, why does why does someone sleep on the street? Um, why don't we give them food? Why don't we give them why don't we give them money? So basically things that in principle seem like they're no brainers. I mean, no one should go hungry when obviously in principle there's enough to eat, right? Um, so all of these things that's, that, that kind of, that's, that are no brainers when you explain them to kids, um, somehow we still get used to them and we don't question them, um, every day. So how, how do you think we, uh, we avoid um, moral fatigue. <laughs> That's a really great question. I, I think the first thing that I'll say is that, you know, arguably we're already suffering from a certain amount of moral fatigue. So maybe I'd reframe your question into how do we pay down the, the moral fatigue that, that we've inherited? Um, but, but I, the other thing that I'll say is that, um, my really, my goal for, for Gitcoin is to build, um, a channel that greater combinations of intelligence and strength can come together. And this is actually a key point that, you know, it's, it's not my values that it, 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 like, I, I don't want the things, the causes that I believe in to be, uh, to be the ones that are funded. I want to build the most perfect the, the best rails for expression of human values um, and for those combinations of strength and intelligence to come together. And so my hope is that by building this coordination infrastructure, um, that when you have these, these areas where there's a very clear coordination failure, in the case of what you asked, like we failed to give this person on a street uh, a like food and probably home and like the chance to contribute to society and to be a productive member of society. Like I, my hope is that by building the rails through which humanity can express its preferences, that we can, um, that, that we can solve some of these coordination failures. And, you know, maybe we build this and it turns out people really do care about homelessness. They just don't have a good coordination mechanism to solve it. Uh, and that would be the bullish case for this, this infrastructure. And the bearish case would be, Oh, we build the signal aggregation preferences and like, people don't care. They just like step over the person on the side of the street. And, you know, that would make me personally sad, but you know, at least we've got the value, like the signal generation, uh, uh, tools out there. And then I think it becomes like an education and, and like a governance question of like, why don't we care about, about these things? Like, what is it about our values that causes us to, sorry, I see you want to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, but Kevin, do you, do you do you think it's a signal thing? Because basically, I think um, I mean, if you if you kind of change the context, right? Say you go hiking, um, and you see, and and basically you're in the middle of nowhere, um, in uh, the Rockies, and you come upon a person who's clearly hungry and thirsty and asks you for food. What do you do? Of course, you give them food, right? Because you're the only person there, right? Basically, but as soon as you actually, uh, if as soon as you transpose the exact same the theme, a theme to um, a downtown anywhere in the world, uh, people react fundamentally differently because they think this is no longer their problem. They're no longer the only person who can solve it. And basically, this is society's problem now, right? So basically, I, I, I would kind of, posit that basically there's like this disconnect between um 
personal morality and societal morality that kind of absolves you from the human decency that to kind of act um, and you step over that person and I'm yeah so I'm I'm not sure whether whether signaling is actually the problem yeah the numbness of of like the lack of hope I think is is a real problem oh, so like first of all I want to say that like I'm extremely privileged to be where I am in my life and working on something that I love and to have a house and a family and all the Maslow's hierarchy things mostly taken care of. And I think that we should not take that for granted. Um, and, and I really feel that like deeply when, when I hear your question asked, um, you know, when I, I wonder why we feel so numb, uh, in that situation. And, and, you know, the, the question that comes to mind for me is that in, in a hike, like, in may it, the way i would try to rationalize it and this may be wrong and it may be totally callous to even try to to even try but i'm going to try against my better judgment is that if i see someone lost in the woods then my assumption is maybe oh they're lost like they just got lost and it was like a mistake whereas i i think that there's many many deep unfurled societal problems with uh homelessness in cities which have to do with probably uh, underfunded social infrastructure. And by the way, this is worse in America than it is for y'all in Europe. Uh, probably mental health, education, drug abuse. And these are systemic problems that cannot be solved by giving someone uh, a sandwich. Uh, like, you know, if someone's just lost in the woods, I, I would presume there's less, uh, there's less systemic issues there. And I do think that um, those systemic issues behind the person in the city, which you know may or may not be right on an individual basis, are are human coordination failures. Um, and I do think that you know we're we're kind of speculating here, but I do think that if if you can solve for the education and and the drug abuse and the lack of employment infrastructure and and all of that kind of stuff, then there maybe people will be less numb and and that we can have more hope but maybe that's an optimistic take and 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 maybe it's even inappropriate for me to speculate uh, about these things from my my place of privilege uh well um i think we'll we'll leave that note to end on it <laughs> but uh no certainly this has like been a really fascinating discussion that has taken us down all kinds of rabbit holes um i wasn't expecting it to get here but uh yeah this is great um so where can people find out more about the the book uh which is called green pill and um and just get involved uh with what you're okay. doing yeah thanks uh so uh you can google me i'm kevin owaki i'm the only uh owaki out there that i think that you'll find if you google that and uh, you can go to greenpill.party if you want to download a digital version of the book. If any of your listeners are at East Denver, then I will be giving out physical copies there as well. Really enjoyed the conversation, and I appreciated that we didn't go that we didn't gloss over the hard topics. Uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation, and thanks so much for having me. And we'll have you again on, but not in four years. <laughs> thanks again, Kevin. It's been a pleasure. Sounds good. Looking forward.